Welcome, welcome, welcome to Reignite Yourself, the Visual Effects Societies and Quebec Film and Television Council's mental health series featuring conversations with professionals from the entertainment industry and mental health specialists. I'm Philip Wolf, co-chair of the VS Health and Wellbeing Committee and will be your host. This series has been created to empower yourselves, ourselves, the visual effects and animation professionals with tools, insights and facts about our mental health. We will talk about our brains, what science can tell us about our emotions, and how our bodies and mind works as one. Our chapters will focus on mental health at work and will also provide you with useful tools for everyday life. Now more than ever, it is time to destigmatize mental health conversations so we can all feel safe, safe to be open and find support. Throughout the series, we will have the honor of welcoming five renowned guests from the industry who have generously accepted to come and start this conversation with us. Caitlin Young, Visual Effects Supervisor at Alpha Studios and on Forbes 30 Under 30 list to watch in Hollywood. Chris White, Visual Effects Supervisor at Veta Digital, who has worked on movies such as Planet of the Apes, King Kong, The Hobbit, and is currently busy on the next Avatar. John Dykstra, Visual Effects Supervisor, recipient of three Academy Awards and co-founder of Industrial Light and Magic. Monica lago Cates, producer and CEO at Frogbot Films. She served as associate producer at Walt Disney Animation on Wreck-It Ralph and Zootopia, then made her live-action debut with Netflix The Christmas Chronicles. Mark Osborne, director of Kung Fu Panda and Lit Pity Prince, film producer, screenwriter and animator. What an amazing lineup. But before further introducing today's guest, I would like to welcome our three mental health professionals who will accompany us throughout this journey. Dr. Amal Abdel-Baki, who is a psychiatrist and the head of the Centre Hospitalier de l'Université de Montréal Youth Mental Health Service. She completed her medical and psychiatric training at University Laval, a master's degree in biomedical science on the predictive factors of the long-term evolution of schizophrenia at University de Montreal and additional research and clinical training in Melbourne, Australia. Her most recent work focuses on the large-scale implementation of early intervention for psychosis and the implementation of a rapid learning system to assess with that. She has also broadened her research focus to include improving access to mental health and comprehensive care for all youth specifically youth at risk or experiencing homelessness through the Access Open Minds Research Network. She is a full clinic professor and is in charge of the Research and Scholarship Committee and responsible for the accompaniment of residents in graduate studies at the Department of Psychiatry and Addictology of the Faculty of Medicine and of the University of Montreal. Dr. Drea Latemendi who is a licensed clinical psychologist, professor, and media consultant. She received her undergraduate degree from Cornell University, her PhD in psychology from UCSD. Dr. Littemendi currently serves as the acting director of the UCLA Student Resilience Center, where she works with college students in the areas of empathy and resilience building, crisis response, and suicide prevention. Dr. Littemendi is a TEDx UCLA speaker and recently delivered a TED session on resilience and media during a pandemic, as part of the special COVID-19 series called Conversations with Ted. Her work on the intersections of pop culture and psychology science have been featured in The Atlantic, The Guardian, Vanity Fair, and The Los Angeles Time. And last but not least, Camille Charbonneau, who is a mental performance consultant with a master's degree in performance and sport psychology. For the last six years, she has been helping high performers see the value that mental skills training has on performance and everyday life. Through teaching tools and strategies based on sport psychology research, she helps people feel confident and focused when it matters the most. Camille has worked with musicians, athletes, coaches, children and business leaders. Her experience as an athlete, educator, and personal trainer make her a consultant with a wide variety of skills. With a holistic approach, she helps people build lifelong skills that ultimately help cultivate more balance, focus, and happiness. Amal, Drea, and Camille, thank you so much for taking part in this initiative and sharing your knowledge with our audience. We are incredibly grateful to have you here with us today. One last thing before we get started. 
As part of the Release Your Creativity project, we would like to thank our supporters without whom this series would not have been possible. The City of Montreal, as well as the studios supporting the project. Caribar, Montreal, DNEC, Framestore, Method Studios, Real Effects and Technicolor. Thank you. This series is available on the visualeffectssociety.com website, vfxmontreal.com, YouTube, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. But now let's get into it. Today we're going to talk about communication, empathy and managing negative feedback with our special guest Monica Lago Cates. Monica is a Latin American producer born in Hollywood and joined Walt Disney Animation Studios in 1994 for the film Pocahontas. She continued to work in a wide variety of production roles on traditional CG and stereoscopic animated films, including Hercules, Meet the Robinson, The Princess and the Frog, and served as associate producer on Wreck-It Ralph and Zootopia. Then she made her live action debut with Netflix The Christmas Chronicles. Her talent for casting put Kurt Russell at the top of the list for his now iconic performance as Santa Claus. M Monica is a co-founder of the non-profit organization Rise Up Animation, which was created as a response to social injustice and inequity. Rise Up Animation provides feedback and guidance for BIPOC individuals around the world who are interested in working in all areas of the animation industry. Monica, welcome and thank you for being with us today. But now let's talk about the different types of communication while people communicate the way they do and how the way we communicate can affect mental health and our performance. We, we're basically, you're born, you're raised, you go to school, you learn how to read and write and, and you learn to be you know, verbal by saying words, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you know how to communicate properly, right? And so I think for me, and this is something I was really honest about, I don't know that I had the most emotional intelligence. I think that was partly because my parents didn't work for other people. They, have, they had their own businesses. So when that happens, you don't necessarily learn how to, you know, how to communicate and influence people because communication, right, as we all know, is much more than just saying words and actively listening. It, there's so many more things to it, right? There's how you say something, there's your verbal and your nonverbal communication, how you look when you're saying it. There's micro like aggressions and cues that your face gives. So all of those things come into play. And I don't know that, well, I, I, while well, I was sensitive and I noticed it, I didn't know what it all meant. And um, I wish I had done it sooner. I really wish there had been classes on it, like, you know, high school before you're leaving or maybe even junior high. And I, the reason I brought up my parents is because since they didn't really possess that kind of finesse in how to be communicating with large groups and influencing large groups of people as managers, I didn't, I wasn't brought up with that as, as well. And so for me, it was a little bit of a bumpy ride. You know, I, I had worked in banking before I got hired at Disney and I found that um, my communication style, which is very direct, it's just honest and um, not... I think also being raised by a mother who is an immigrant, so English was her second language, she taught us that the way to speak was to grab the easiest word that came to mind. Does that make sense? So sometimes you'll find someone who, and I, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm singing the choir as well with Philip, you mean you're German, so I don't know if you experienced that, where sometimes you're trying to think of, of the word, and sometimes it's in maybe in German and it comes out, the equivalent isn't exactly, maybe the word holds too much weight or not. And so I feel like that's what I was kind of, a, I would almost say a victim of because that's how I learned to communicate. And that isn't the best way. And so for me, there was a lot of like, what I say, I hit off, I got hit over the head a lot. Um, and, and people tried to help kind of let me know that maybe I should be learning some emotional intelligence, but they didn't know what to call it. And they didn't know how to, to rally around me. And so because of that, I did get, feedback and I, I do think feedback is an amazing gift so you know we can talk about that more but that's you know I mean that's just kind of how I look at communication and my experience with it which you know I, I like to be honest about the fact that I I when I was younger I could always say what was on my mind that didn't make me a great communicator though. Hmm. right so um I don't know what else can I say <laughs> Monica is there anything that you do to actively continue to develop your communication skills and if so, what does that look like? Um, well, I would say that for me, that's a great question. Thanks, Camille. I, 
one of the other things to know about me is that I am dyslexic, but I was never diagnosed as dyslexic. Um, in the you know, early 70s, it wasn't as it wasn't something that people were really diagnosing as much. So it actually was quite hard for me to learn how to read. So by the time I learned how to read, they were just like, you know, I had to play catch up. And so then they didn't worry about my spelling. And I actually, I was really bad at spelling for a long time. And so I know it seems like a long answer to your question, but I feel like for me, I, I get daily vocabulary sent to me. My, my vocabulary has grown leaps and bounds since I realized it was something that, I, you know, I hadn't really had, I was kind of lacking, not because I wasn't smart, but because we were focusing on other things for me as a dyslexic student. You know, it made it made junior call, uh, junior high and high school difficult for me because I I did see things slightly differently. Um, so for me, I'm actively I'm, I read a lot. I read a lot of books. Uh, I've done a lot of training sessions. I went to a ton of managerial classes. I took personality tests. You know, Myers Briggs. Um, there was like a Harvard one. I mean, tons of them. So for me, I would say that I spent a lot of time taking feedback to heart and even if it wasn't great feedback it was kind of uh vague because i think people aren't great if they're not great at communicating they're not going to be great at giving you feedback necessarily right and people feel like if they're giving you feedback and it isn't about the job if they're trying to talk to you about like interpersonal skills which some people like to call soft skills to me it's not soft communication is an interpersonal skill and so people don't always like to comment on it because i think they feel like they're insulting you as a person and I think that's a mistake. I think that's, again, one of those taboos that we need to, as a society, get past and realize, no, no, you can let somebody know that, hey, you know, um, I wish they had said to me, you know, you're, you have such great points, you're very passionate. Sometimes the words you might be choosing, you don't realize the weight of them. I had to kind of discern that from feedback and realize it. So I would say, Camille, I spend a lot of time thinking before I speak. People think I'm filtering and sometimes I'll even do this. Like I, you know, I do tons of feedback sessions with my mentees. And just yesterday I was trying to think, I said, you know, I have to, I have to think about how I want to verbalize this. They're like, oh no, no, just, just like spit it out. And I'm like, no, no, it's, it's not that I'm afraid to say it. It's that I don't want the word that I select for you to take it so strong. So yeah, I just think it's about educating yourself and mm -hmm. always being willing to look within and to be better than than you were yesterday. You mentioned emotional intelligence. Yes. And I think that's so important to highlight here because often, especially in this industry, it sounds as though that can be undervalued. So in other words, the skills of um, recognizing emotions, interpreting emotions and expressing emotions in ways um, that you intend to express them, all this stuff, mm -hmm. you're right, these are critical skills. And yet, I think in some industries and in some professional identities, that isn't talked about enough. And the other thing you mentioned that I'm curious to learn more about is this dynamic of intent and impact. So you clearly are very thoughtful about your communication. You mentioned taking some time to critically think about what words you might be choosing and how you might convey a message often we might intend something good and then say something and the impact can be negative or unintended. And those kinds of ruptures can um, impact the people that we work with and sometimes in negative ways. Can you talk more about that? Do you have experiences there? Maybe ones you've had that led you to modify or refine the way that you communicate? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that. I, I would say First, just going back to like emotional intelligence, it's not even something that I even knew about until, I don't know, I feel like 20, you know, maybe 15 years ago, 10 years ago, it wasn't really talked about as much, even though probably the book that was written about it by, you know, uh, the, uh, I can't think of his name, but he's like the one author that was started to write about it a lot some years ago. But I feel like people don't realize the importance of it. They just talk about the IQ, your intelligence, how you do your job, not realizing that, especially in my role as a producer, as someone who's trying to facilitate and help people get things done. It's, it's all about communication, verbal, nonverbal, written, you know, you're sitting in a meeting, you're getting bad news. It's how you react. And I am not a poker player. I mean, I can play poker, but I don't have a poker face. I just don't like, I don't, 
I, I kind of wish I did. I've met people who have that ability to just kind of camouflage everything. You can't read them. But I'm just, I'm just not that. I'm so authentic that I just don't even know how to do that. I wouldn't know how to begin. So you might say something and I might be going, hmm. That doesn't mean I'm disagreeing. I'm just thinking, you know. Um, so kind of back to your question, like when I think about my experiences um, in production, so that would be Disney, you know, real effects. I worked at for a little bit and I've worked with a lot of vendors. So different when we outsource work, so different, a lot of different uh, visual effects houses, digital domain. I worked with Method on, um, she was one of your sponsors. I love that. Um, on, uh, on the Christmas Chronicles, I, I would say that the thing that I noticed was that you, a lot of it was actually getting to know the person you were talking with, your audience. That's such a huge piece. What we always tell our production management now that are coming up is really know your audience because I could have the best intentions like you just verbalized, right? And I want to deliver something that I think is maybe good news or what have you. And the other person doesn't take it that way. And I have to be thinking about not just my point of view, but theirs, how they're going to receive it. So I think it's important to understand the different personality types because that goes with different communication styles, right? There's introverted people, there's extroverted people, but there's also ambiverts, people that are in the middle, which is what I am. I present as very extroverted, but I'm actually, I'm not a full extrovert at all. And so, but I, you know, I had to read this book quiet, you know, uh, it's amazing. And it talks a lot about the introverts and extroverts. And I, I realized that's when I realized I was an ambivert and really understanding how introverts process versus someone who's more, a little bit more extroverted was really enlightening. So I think, I think people, you know, for me, it needs to start in schools. It needs to be also in the workplace. People need to be discussing it, having classes on it. I know it was something that I was starting to do at Disney after I came back from fighting cancer because I came back very, you know, you go through something where you're, you face death and your perspective changes quite a bit. And I was already in a good place as far as communication, not perfect by any means, still potentially considered a little bit of a bull in the China shop, you know, very honest and direct. Um, which isn't always celebrated, I'll just say. <laughs> you know, you think that if you're just being honest and direct, that that would be fine. But some people actually consider it criticism, or I've had people say I was yelling at them just because I said to them, you really can't work overtime for free. And they would be like, God, you're yelling at me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, they only knew because I can raise my voice. But you know what I mean? So I think a lot of it is really where the other person's coming from. I think communication's not just hard for the giver, but it's all about that receiver. I think that's very, very interesting what you're saying, Monica, because uh, sometimes people don't realize the way they communicate, you know, because depending on like uh, how they've been raised or where they come from, the way communication was uh, was uh, done in a, a family when we were younger, we can sometimes get really used to some level of negativity or even sometimes aggressivity in the way of communication. And uh, sometimes um, people don't know that they that there's something else that can exist. And they tolerate with time like very uh, sometimes harsh uh, way of communicating or they can uh, uh, tolerate like extreme negativity from their partners, from their colleagues, mm -hmm. from their supervisor and their boss. And with time, you know, th those words hurt. They can, you know, make the wounds uh, deeper and deeper. And eventually when that's repeated and repeated, uh, it can like uh, have an impact on motivation to go to work on the pleasure of working and even eventually work performance which is exactly the opposite that everyone wants but this we find that often in the workplace i don't know if you've had like experiences with that or uh... very much so and i and i i don't exactly know where it comes from i i think what i mean by where it comes from is sometimes like i, I when i was at disney i mean i was there for 23 years. So I saw a lot of different, what I like to call regimes, right? There was the first one and then those people left and someone else took over and then someone else. And with each one, there's a different style, right? That comes in and everybody tries to do their best. or so they say that, 
But sometimes when you focus so much on feedback, like we went through a time where it was like, we need to be giving people feedback. They don't know how they're doing. And it felt like it was coming from a really good place, but what it translated into, and I think really unintentional from leadership was you're not good enough. <laughs> like it was always the things you weren't doing right. And it becomes this constant messaging of you're not good enough. And I will say that for me, and, and look, I had amazing experiences with some of the most amazing artists in the world. I learned a lot and I grew up there, but did I experience that kind of toxic negativity that makes you not want to necessarily come to work? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think a lot of people do. And I think it's what burns you out. You know, it, I, I really believe it's important to give people feedback. It is a gift, but you have to tell them what they do really well. And then you have to tell them the things that they need to be working on. And you have to be so careful about how you verbalize it. You know, you can't just blurt out like to, to for example, to translate. Um, if somebody wants to tell me that I'm, I'm so direct that sometimes it can be a little off putting. That's a great, better way to say it than how I was told, which was like, Oh, you're, you're just, you're just too much. And they put their hands up. Like, what does that even mean? Or you're just, um, yeah, and you're just a little like toxic or, you know, and you're like, or, you know, aggressive, like all those tales that you hear about with a female who is just as powerful as her male counterpart. Um, I was getting all of those cause I'm actually quite, I'm, I'm very masculine, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a woman, but I'm more masculine than I am feminine. And I think that's okay. Just like I, you know, I'm, I know masculine, I know men who are, have a, a lot more femininity to them. And I love that. Like you should be able to be either. And so for me, I was definitely got a lot of messages that it was not appropriate and that I needed to be different and I needed to fit into a box. And I did the best that I could. I think the other thing that you made me think of, um, Dr. Amal, is when you were talking about cultures and how we're raised. So that's another big thing. Like I didn't realize how much my mother's culture and her, you know, her being born in South America, so she's Argentinian, affected me in growing up. And we're also Italian, like so we're very, very passionate. You know, we speak with our hands, and, you know, and all of those things. And to us, to your point, it's normal. We can have a huge fight and kiss and make up and never think the next thing of it. But you go to another like household that may be more European American or what you know people like to refer to as white. I tend not to call people white because it's a social construct. But at the end of the day, they have a very different upbringing. They much they may not even fight. They may not even share how they feel. That's considered rude. And so, but I didn't know that because I wasn't raised with that. I was raised with these passionate parents. And I think there's a lot of people in the workplace that experience that, and we're considered different because most of most of the world is what you want to call in quotes white They're, they don't have that and so you have middle easterners and all you know french all these people right and asian and it's like we have different cultural things that we're bringing to the table why not embrace it instead of making people feel bad about themselves so I, I agree I, I think it's very yeah. interesting what you're saying it's it's all about like communicating, like the way people, uh, how you feel about the way someone is talking to you and discussing those things, uh, uh, you know, like saying how for you, this is not, it's just being passionate. It's not uh, shouting at people and what's the intention behind. And when that can be discussed, I think whatever is being said or you know, can be worked out. And uh, I think that's an, an important issue, but I guess often people don't, um, uh, like they, they, they don't want to stand up and, and talk about how they feel to their boss or their super for supervisor. And that kind of creates some very stressful environment. I, I don't think it's like necessarily someone's fault. It's like sometimes just a, cool. uh, interaction between people. Absolutely. And a lot of people don't feel comfortable speaking up to their boss about certain things. I mean, even myself, I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm what people consider and myself, I'm pretty brave. I'm, you know, I'm definitely outspoken. And if, if I'm having difficulty with a person who I'm working side by side with, or someone who works for me, I always come to it as what have I done? I mean, that, and that's definitely something that Brene Brown taught me about vulnerability. So again, lots of reading here. Um, but that whole idea of like, if you go to somebody and you're like, why were you mean to me? That's going to put them on the defense. 
So for me, I tend to approach it. I always approach it from a place of like, hey, is something going on? Is there anything that I've done? Can I help you? And that tends to make the person more comfortable. Now, not everybody. Some people are just not good people. And they'll just always make you feel like you're crazy, like they're not doing anything. And so at that point, you have to just go, okay, they're not my people. I'm not going to be able to get through to them. I'm still going to be respectful, but I'm going to know that there's not much more I can do on this front. But generally, I have found that if you do have the conversation, broach it in a way that's respectful and really from a place of, and I know it sounds crazy, but I feel like we all need to be coming from a place of love, which manifests into kindness. Um, it's going to, it's going to come off the right way. And so I think sometimes though, with your bosses, that still is, can be a little bit hard because at the end of the day, if that conversation doesn't go right, I, like anyone else, I'm going to be afraid that I could lose my job. Did I still have those conversations? Yeah, but I really had to pick them. So that's that whole thing about picking your battles. Lovely. I think it's important to understand that everyone communicates differently, right? That's, I think, the first, uh, the first step there. And um, I lost my train of thought. Hold on. Everyone communicates differently. And I would be curious, since you're, like, you're clearly aware of that, what are some tools or strategies that you use to, to manage negative feedback when you do get that, that type of feedback that perhaps doesn't settle right with you? That's a great question. So the, the very young Monica in her 20s probably would have said right then, what do you mean by that? <laughs> but now <laughs> the more mature Monica. Um, and again, I, I really, I, I, I give kudos to, for, to Disney for helping me learn these things, even though it, it wasn't set out that way. I, I had to learn on my own. But now it's much more about, I hear what people are saying to me. And taking it in, because at the end of the day, if they're trying to tell me something and give me feedback, even if I don't agree, I need to wait and digest it, because otherwise you just come off as defensive. Mm -hmm. So my strategy usually is to try to listen and hear, especially in the professional environment, and then come back around and say, hey, so yesterday or a week or whatever it was, you don't want to wait too long. A couple days ago, or when we met earlier this week, I wanted to follow up because there were a couple of you know pieces of feedback that you gave me and and it it felt a little bit x y and z like maybe you know it felt like I, i'm feeling like i'm i'm not doing a good job is that really is that really what you were saying to me because you said and then i usually quote them verbatim because i'm i have the memory of an elephant and then they'll be like no i didn't say that and i'm thinking yeah you did but then they're like cuz sometimes people don't say what they mean right so that's how I tend to look at, I don't handle it, Camille. I mean, mm -hmm. there are also times where for me, when I'm going to give feedback to somebody, I absolutely think about how they want to receive it. And, and, and sometimes I'll even ask them, like, for example, and this may sound funny, but I'm the type of person that if you're going to give me feedback, I want to hear the negative first. And then I want to leave with the positive. Because if you're telling me the positive first, I'm so worried about what I'm not doing right that I can't even enjoy the positive. Yeah. But that's very personal to me. Not everyone's that way. So sometimes when I I do this thing, when someone gets hired uh, on one of my shows, even if I have 300 people, if I don't know you and you're new to the studio, I always do a meet and greet. And I sit down and I talk about the studio. I talk about how I am, how I manage. And I'll say to them, hey, how do you how do you like to receive feedback? And, you know, I like to hear what I'm not doing well for. You know, I kind of use myself as an example. And they'll tend to say, like, no, well, I like to know that I'm doing something good, what I need to work on, and, and then follow up with something good again. I'm great, good to know. And I try to keep notes and remember that. And I try to cater how I'm giving that to people so they'll receive it in the best way because I can't control how other people receive it, right? So I do think a lot of what we're talking about is really incumbent on the person giving that feedback. And yes, there's a, so, and then if I'm on the other end of it and I've received feedback that's really disheartening and you know um hurtful and you know i might go home and have a good cry and and digest it and and go okay where is that coming from because some people just aren't really nice and they don't they just don't like you no matter how hard you try that's another thing that i think human beings don't get and i definitely learned that from uh, a life coach who said you know they may just not be your people. And instead of trying to make them your people, just accept that, be respectful, agree that you're not each other's people and just move on. 
And so sometimes when I would get that feedback from that person, I'd be like, why don't they like me? I just, I'm so, I'm really nice. I know I can be outspoken. And instead it's more about, okay, well, they don't like me. So maybe that feedback has a grain of truth. Let me really digest it and take away what I think the behavior is they're speaking of and let the rest go. Mm -hmm. I'd love to know if confidence or stress would affect the way you communicate. You mean the person's confidence or my confidence? You, there's your, your confidence. So the way you, if you wake up one day and your confidence, you know, isn't at its highest or you're feeling, and you're feeling really stressed, would that affect the way you communicate? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I tend to always feel confident, but there are times where I know that I don't know something. So it's not like it's my confidence, it's more just like, my knowledge of an area. So for example, I may be in a situation where if I've just gotten promoted, you know, in my, in my career, if I had just gotten promoted and I go into a room, if you're overly confident, you may not be list, active listening. So I do think that I will adjust based on that. It's more about what do I, what I may not know. And, and I'll try to, I try to take a little bit of a, a learning stance where I'm learning, but I am really talkative. I can tell you that. So, I mean, I definitely am I'm really talkative. And so I'm not the last person to speak. I'm usually one of the first, which can be, you know, bothersome to some people uh, who think I shouldn't be the first to speak because of just my personality or that I'm a female. Um, so I would say that what I tend to do is if I'm stressed or nervous because this is like a new experience or maybe I'm pitching and I haven't pitched this before, um, I will be a little bit more quiet i will use less words and it's maybe not that obvious to people but i slow myself down mm. i'm just i'm just a little bit more calculated honestly or more conscious mm -hmm. yeah as I, alert as I hear you speak i am noticing the potential that your mentorship and leadership has a very positive impact on um, young learners and emerging professionals in the, this industry just being able to witness and observe the way that you manage space. Because a, a lot of times, I'm, as I hear you describe your examples, you know, one thing that comes up for me is that this is a journey. So st at your starting point, there maybe were different approaches and there were cultural, uh, international, um, family level uh, factors that impact your communication. And as I'm understanding it in this industry, it's really important to communicate with clarity. Um, and also Monica, I'm hearing you say, and it's also important to, to dismantle some of the existing structures that are not in your favor and are not in the favor of the people that you're mentoring. And right. you do this not by burning everything down. Um, in, in this industry, it sounds as though that's not helpful, but instead to model the um, thoroughness, the thoughtfulness, and the strategies that do work for you. That I think is really empowering for the people that might look to you for ways to manage their own spaces. So for that, I'm really grateful that you're a part of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I'm, I have no, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Illusions about how I have failed in the past with communication or rubbed people the wrong way. Like I own all of that. I mean, I was told once that, you know, sometimes I could suck the air out of a room because of, you know, I, my strong opinion, because I, you know, I am, I am very much um, a fighter of justice. And so if I see it happening and you know, that happens in rooms. Right. And so I will continue to fight. And sometimes I've had to learn it's not worth it you're you know if it, you have to choose between sometimes a moment in your life in your career and how that's going to reflect and and the thing you're fighting for so it's probably really good that i now you know work at my own production company and i think i think that helps but i would say even before i left disney you know i i realized um and it's funny because i actually did a um, a resilience talk about resilience. And in that talk, I basically talked about the fact that I got to a certain point in my career. So probably within the first 10 years, I wasn't moving up again. I was being passed over by males. 
And it wasn't because I didn't know the job. It was clearly personality, but nobody knew how to verbalize it to me. Because they, again, they were, they were very old school and thought, you can't speak about personality to people. You, and they would say to me, well, I just don't want to change you. And I'm like, so how I, with all the me educating myself and realizing, okay, I finally realized like, I can't blame other people about not promoting me. This is, I have to, I'm the only person I can control. I can't control them. And so it was very important for me to kind of step away. And that's why I read all these books and, and really looked at myself and said, okay, what are you projecting? And what part of yourself, you know, who we are born, how we're born. I may have been born really shy, but I'm able to be assertive now and, and, and more outward and outspoken. And some people aren't like that. But if you want to be a leader, I'm not saying that you have to change your personality, but you do have to act as if. If you're in a room where you're supposed to be leading and that's the position you're in, you do have to, to sometimes come out of your own personality, your comfort zone, and be that leader and then go back to be yourself. No one's trying to change you. And I wish that those leaders who were speaking to me had understand and been able to speak to me about that and say, look, we love that you're all these things, but when you're in this room with these people, this is how they could be taking it. And you don't even know it. So we're not asking you to change all of, all of the aspects of you or all of the time, but just think about it when you're in these rooms. And so that's what I've tried to do with my coaching. So I was like a studio department leader for some years after I came back from my bout of cancer. And I worked with, I would meet with all of the production staff and there were like 50 to 80 people. And you have to look at them and talk to them in that way, right? M try to make them understand that, you know, some of them would say, oh, I'm getting this feedback that I need to have more of a voice. And I'm like, I don't even know what that means. And I'm like, let me translate that for you. It means that they're seeing you in a room where you're supposed to be leading and you're not, you're not speaking up, you're not driving, you're not, you're not setting the agenda and helping things to move along. And that's what they mean by your voice. But they're not, I apologize to you that they're not equipped to actually give you the correct feedback. And so they would be like, oh, and they'll be like, well, I can't be like you. I'm not like you. And I said, I'm not expecting you to be like me. I'm expecting you to be a little bit more of you in that room so that you're driving. If you want to be a supervisor, if you don't want to be a supervisor, you can just go back and, and not, but that's what's required of the job, you know? So part of it is also trying to make people realize what the job expects and not make them feel bad because of how they were, to your point, brought up or their, their innate personality, right? They're, we, we have different personality types, right? If any, I'm sure all of you as doctors and, and professionals and, you've taken those tests, right? Those personality tests. And while they may not be based in, in medical, you know, they may be considered, oh, they're not that good. There's some good about it. It's kind of like, gives you some idea about different people in the world. It, it at least opens your mind a bit, I would say. What do you guys think about that? Sometimes they're just as reliable as the Harry Potter sorting, sorting ad <laughs> tests we find online, honestly. <laughs> No, they are. And I was going to say, it's probably like horoscopes where there's a little bit of truth, but it's like yeah. horoscope. But, but there is something about like, you, you tend to go, yeah, but I do know someone like that. I do know someone who is very analytical and, and that's the first thing they come with. And you're like, they don't seem like they have any empathy. And I think empathy mm -hmm. is one of the most important um, traits to possess. So. I was wondering, Monica, like if, because you were mentioning um, some experiences you had, and I was wondering if it happened to you and how you react in those situations where uh, maybe like a colleague of yours, which is in a, a superiority position or your, or your own boss even, uh, lacks empathy towards either one of your colleague or someone that's uh, working uh, like, you know, under your supervision. And, uh, and let's say you... Um, you witness that they, their communication is might be a bit intimidating or uh, so they might do that without realizing it uh, mm -hmm. or maybe they do realize it, but they think it's right to do so. So how do you react uh, in those situations as, you know, a, a colleague or uh, how do you think we can help if uh, someone is in that position? Well, um, that's a great question as well. And I have a couple of thoughts. So it depends on the person. So I have worked with colleagues who I've witnessed that. And I've also 
been told multiple times, like people don't want to know. They don't want to know. They don't want to know the truth. And so, and I, and I, but the person I was, I was like, no, no, they want to know. They want to be better. So for me, I, I tend to try to help diffuse it if I'm in there witnessing it. If I see a colleague who's being disrespectful or speaking over somebody, I always try to lead by example. Like, I'm not going to change the world into not using the word white, but I can at least let people understand that I don't like to call people white. And I, and I tell my husband, don't call yourself that. You actually have some Mexican in you. So, so to me, it's all about like leading by example. So if I'm in a situation where I see somebody behaving that way, I will try to make light of it. Sometimes then I get tr in trouble for that later because someone will come at me. But you know what? I can stand up for myself, so I'm all right with that. For me, it's about protecting the person. Um, but I've been in situations where I've worked with directors who are literally so toxic and abusive and screamers and ugly, and they didn't like women and they liked men. And, and, you know, and literally was in a situation where maybe they were talked to about it once, you know, like that's not enough to change a behavior to someone who's in such a powerful position. And literally that person wasn't being told enough to change their ways. And so for me, I knew that I couldn't tell them to change their ways. I would have been fired. So what I did is I put myself right next to them. And so when they got mad, I let them scream at me and I took it so that it would protect everyone else. And that is how I protected my team. Now, does it make it right? No, I probably got sick because of it. So would I do that today? Probably not. But it was one of the ways in which I coped. And um, I think today, the person I am today, because that was some years ago, it was probably 10 years ago. I think I would have gotten much more, um, I would have gone to allies that were above me as well and tried to work in a way to make them see that this was really toxic and really, you know, but the problem is, is that, you know, until Me Too and until a lot of these things have come up, like we've all known it's bad behavior, but it's been acceptable. It's unfortunately, it has been allowed to continue. So. You know, sometimes I will see somebody and, and if they say something to me afterwards, like tongue in cheek, like, was I a little too hard? I'll say, do you want to know the truth? And that's my way in. Because if somebody doesn't, because I'm like, because if you know, if you're asking me, I'm going to tell you the truth. If you really don't want to hear it, then don't ask. Me. And they'll say, no, no, I want to know. And then I'll tell them. And that's how I do it. Um, so that's a, that's a very interesting answer. Because everybody knows that one thing I am is truth. Mm -hmm. I don't lie. I lied as a kid because my parents divorced and I was embarrassed that I didn't go on camping trips and I would lie. I'd be like, yeah, my, so when I was a little, little kid, I lied and I realized how that was not a person I ever wanted to be. And so I went the opposite way mm -hmm. and I don't, lie. I'll say nothing, but don't, if you ask me for my, what I think you have to be ready. So I always preface it. Do you really want to know? <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Cause, Cause I guess in the, because it's a high performance environment and under a lot of pressure because like you have to do everything very quickly and and very fast and uh, uh, I guess the bosses can be stressed out too and they might themselves uh, get like uh, impacted by the stress and then miscommunicate, miscommunicate with people and put pressure on them maybe without realizing it or you know maybe that you know they, they that. Yeah. So how, how do you, how do you, how do you do when you realize that that's happened and without like being your intention, but. I apologize immediately. As soon as I've realized. So for example, sometimes you're just stressed and you're, you're, you know, remember that you're going a little unconscious and a lot of people have don't understand how there's the conscious and the unconscious. They, they haven't, you know, they haven't had as much therapy as I've had. They haven't read Eckhart Tolle, which, you know, is really one of my, I'm, I'm not a, I'm a spiritual person. I don't follow any organized religion, but I really found his books to be very telling for me about the mind. And so that was the other thing that, that, that kind of helped me on my journey. In fact, when I talk about my resilience and when I was realizing I wasn't getting where I was blaming everything and I was being very negative, I read Eckhart Tolle. Actually, it was my husband came to me first and he actually ordered something called The Secret. And it was a video and it basically said, it talked about the law of attraction. He was really kind of convinced that it, I was maybe um, attracting negativity because I was being negative. Like, oh, I'm never going to get promoted. Uh, nobody like, you know, 
instead of like working on being a better version of myself. And so that really was kind of like a slap in the face, right? I was looking, he basically showed me a mirror. So I always give my husband credit for that. And then, and then I got Eckhart Tolle and I read both of his books and saw all, you know, and I, I've been to a convention for three days with him. And like, I realized for me that it was very important to, to try to always be as conscious and poss as possible, unless I want to be meditating and kind of letting things go. And so for me, what, when I, I will go unconscious, I'm human, right? The, the mind takes over. And so if I'm really stressed, it can happen. And I go unconscious and I might just be, this is what we need to do, blah, 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 whatever. And, and as soon as I kind of realized, oh, wow, I was stressed and I was kind of barky. Oh my gosh, I need to go apologize. And so I, I'll go to the person and I'll be like, Hey, I'm really sorry. I realized I was totally barky because I was stressing. And I want, you know, that was not about you. And almost nine times out of 10 people, human beings will go, Oh no, I knew that. That's not true. They're just saying that because they don't know how to handle it. Instead of just saying, thank you. Simple. Thank you for that. A lot of them will be, Oh no. Or some people will say, Oh, look, and th these people mean it. They're like, look, I know you well enough to know that wasn't about me. And you're like, Oh, I love that. And so again, back to when I, if I'm hiring someone like an assistant, I always say to them, look, for the most time, most part, I'm really present and I try to be really kind of in the moment and kind and whatever, but there's going to be times where I'm really stressed and I just need to tell you what I need. Don't take it personally. And if it hurts your feelings, let's talk about it. Cause nine times out of 10, I do not mean it. I didn't mean it that way. So for me, it's about owning it and apologizing. And I know that was a long answer, but I felt like there was a lot to say on it. <laughs> A lot of these conversations mm. might be challenging to have, especially for juniors, right? Yes. Um, do you have any tips for for juniors that are listening with they have to have a, a challenging conversation with, with their boss or their leader? How would how can they approach that? So that's a great question. So I'm actually mentoring a nineteen year old right now, which is like one of my youngest mentees. I didn't even know she was nineteen, I thought she was twenty two, because most of them are like in college. And she's been hired to be a junior producer and I adore her. And so we do this mentorship where she talks to me about kind of what's happening. And so literally this fit, this question fits right in there. And what I've said to her is I've actually uh, mentioned to her a couple of books because I think it's really important. You, you, you know, someone can tell you what to do, but sometimes you have to understand it. So I mentioned a couple of books, you know, even some one that's really, really old. It's called um, How to Make Friends and Influence People. It's one of the originals, right? And it doesn't matter how many years have gone by since it was published, because I think it's from, is it from the 30s or something? Or It's really old, but it, it still holds true today. And so for me, I try to tell them about that. I try to tell them to, to look at emotional intelligence and try to understand. And then I always tell them to come to it from a place of, so if their boss is doing something, or right now they, they're, they're dealing with some issues with their peers, I always tell them to do exactly what I mentioned earlier in the conversation, which is to say, Hey, is everything okay? Or have I done something? Mm -hmm. Cause I've noticed that it, it feels like there, there've been things that you haven't been happy with maybe with my performance. And I don't know if, if you're unhappy or if maybe something else is going on. So there was a time where I had a boss who I made a call. I was a production manager. It should have been within my purview to make the call, but he got so angry. And I've never seen him angry and never at me and never like this. And he was like, you should not have made that. I mean, he was literally like yelling at me and I, and I kind and I just got very quiet because normally like, I'm like, don't, who the F do you think you're talking to? Like, I don't let people yell at me, but I was like, I got really quiet. And I was like, something's going on here. Right. And so I said to him, Hey, like, I understand you're upset about this, but have I done something else? Cause this feels like a really big reaction to this one thing. So is this like, is there a pattern of things that you're upset at me about? Like I just asked mm -hmm. and he literally was like, no, no, I'm just really upset about this. And I was like, okay, well, I want you to know that you're really yelling at me and you're really upset. And it feels like, you, you know, and you know, look, he apologized, you know, he realized it. So anyway, that that's just how I kind of handle it. I think, um, I, I am, I'm, it's hard because I am really confident now, you know, and, and even when I wasn't, I was. Does that make sense? Like, I don't mean that I was faking it. I just, and it wasn't an entitlement. It was just, I was raised by a very progressive mother who felt like my voice counted. 
and I walked into a corporate world and it makes me kind of sad. It makes me tear up because I worked, I walked into a male, a man's world, a white man's world of animation. And it was, you know, there were very few female producers. There were none that looked like me. There were no Hispanic, no black. There was one Japanese woman I had heard tell of her and she was in another building. So I didn't have access to her. And now we work with her all the time, Philip and I. And um, so for me, being told that I shouldn't have a voice and even when I was an associate producer and I was at a table with other leaders at my level or above, I would say my opinion and afterwards I would get feedback from my boss that another producer said, who the F does she think she is speaking up? But I was at the table. So that kind of messaging is really, really destructive and detrimental. And what should have happened is my boss should have turned to that person and said, she's an associate producer at this studio and she has every right. But the fact that she came to give me the feedback was basically saying he was right. Now, they could have said, you know what, what he's, what she might've wanted to say to me and I wasn't, you know, and I didn't take it that way was, look, he's not uh, bristling at the fact that you have a voice. He didn't like the way you said it. But that was not the feedback I got. If, if that was the case, that would be very different. Because I think that's very um, common. It's not what we say, it's how we say it. So how, you know, how, you can tell how oh, sorry, I was going to ask, well, how did that impact your like confidence or uh, your later like interactions with those people? You know, I would say for a couple of days, like I'm the type of person that when I get hard feedback, I am so hard on myself. <laughs> this, people might find this surprising. So I literally let it almost break me down. I take it all in and I almost cocoon myself. I take it all in and I go home and I'll cry to my husband because I'm, I'm emotional, I'll cry, get into bed, go to sleep, whatever. Maybe I have a drink, whatever. I'm not suggesting people think. Um, and then the next day I kind of come back out of it like, okay, it's a new day. I've learned from that and I move forward. So I will be a little bit more careful with the individual who made the note, not my boss, but like, okay, he's in the room. So I need to, I need to be cognizant of that. So it, it is a little bit unfortunate. It's like, it's like playing a game a little bit. Um, but I will also say that I tend to forget about it pretty quick and I go right back to being myself. So I don't think it totally affected me. You know, like I didn't stop having a voice, but I was probably much more measured and, really thinking about how I said it, because otherwise, you know, if you're asking an opinion of the group, why am I lesser than? So I don't, I don't really let it a hundred percent, you know, change. me. So I guess that's very important what you're saying, Monica, that, you know, sometimes we, especially when we are in, we were junior in, in the company or we're like in our first years of working, sometimes it's hard to speak up and sometimes we don't do it the best way or at the best moment or the best place. And sometimes we're not told the best way that it wasn't like perfect. And I guess it's very important not to understand from that, that you should shut up and not speak up a anymore, but try to learn how to do so. And I think that's very interesting from what you've been saying. And, and, and you know, you were mentioning that you, when you were going back home, you were talking to your husband about it. Like, were you like discussing with him, like uh, the perception you had of the situation and like get his advice, him knowing you or like, how, how would you discuss that with him? Well, well, luckily in my position, my husband actually knew all the people because we had worked together. We met at Disney. I know that a lot of people don't have that. You know, you, you work in one industry, they work in another. So what I tend to do is I just tend to come home and he'll say like, what's wrong? Because, you know, you can tell maybe I come in and I immediately burst into tears, you know, whatever. And I tend to tell him what transpired. So I'll say, this is what happened. Not how, I, and, and then of course, with that, I tend to say, and I don't really think I did anything wrong. You know, we kind of talk through it. And he, what I think a lot of people need is someone to just listen. You know, we're not looking, we all try to solve each other's problems, but that's not really what human beings want. They really just want to be heard. Like, I hear you. And how do you feel? And what do you think about it? And what are you going to do next? That kind of a thing. And so for me, for me, I like to take in feedback. I don't mean to take, I mean, I don't want to take it so hard, but I do know that I take it in to every cell and every essence of myself. And I really just let, It come in so that I can really analyze it and go, 
Is there a truth to it at all? So if somebody, you know, says anything to me, like even right now, if you guys are like, I don't know, whatever the criticism could be, you know, I, I would be like, huh, I'd listen. And I may dismiss some of it, but I'd be like, oh, I, I do see that I do that. I need to be aware. You know, that's just, that's just how I roll. But I think for junior people starting out who don't have all that, um, my biggest, I think, advice to them is to, to, to read, to learn about themselves, to understand what true communication is like. Think about the other people. If you don't feel comfortable about having a conversation with someone, but you're feeling stressed, find a mentor. So find someone you can trust that is maybe not even on your, on your project. Like if you're working in a building like Disney or, you know, um, Neg or what have you, and you're on a project and you're having some type of toxic environment, abusive, or just even you're not pleasing your boss. It could be something as that. It's not even, you're just, you can't seem to please them is to go to someone else that you know won't share what you're discussing. That's very, very important. And I also tell people that you're at work, not everyone's your friend. And so you have to be very particular about who you share with. If you're unhappy, like I think one of the reasons I was successful at Disney um, is because when I was a, so when I was a production assistant, okay, I was in a very, very difficult position. I was working for a boss who was very, very mean to me. I never did anything right. And, you know, and I don't think it meant to be that way. She was just a teacher. And so she would just always be teaching. And it was always a negative. I never heard anything I was doing well. And so I will say that for the longest time, I never said anything. But finally, and I never talked about it with anyone. There were people who would observe it, but I never spoke about it because I was brought up Italian and you know, you don't always speak outside of the family. So I was like, that may not look good. So I kept it to myself and people would notice it and they would say to me, I see what's going on. And I would say, you do? Yeah, okay, all right. They're like, you're good, you're doing a good job. Okay, thank you. You know, and you need that, you cling to that. But I will say one day she pushed me too far she had gone away on vacation and I was covering for her and she came back and she had, not, I had done so many of the tasks, everything that she asked for. And I think I made one mistake or two mistakes, but I mean, I was a little PA and she came back and all she focused on was what I didn't do right. And I literally turned to her and I said, I, you, you must just hate me because I'm a, I do nothing right. You must just really dislike me. Like I, do I do anything? It was really interesting. It was a very telling moment because it was very vulnerable of me. And she was very apologetic and it changed our relationship at that moment forever. And actually she was my maid of honor, one of my best friends. Yeah. So, you know, I think people don't know sometimes how they behave. You know, I know I didn't for a long time. And I think they're not as malicious as people think or, or maybe they are. And I really think that the organizations need to be putting things in place to be looking. And I don't mean, you know, necessarily testing people, but really looking at them. And, you know, so, so taking... Monica, the mentorship you were talking about that you were doing with a 19 year old uh, producer, I think, or assistant producer you're mentioning, yes. is that something that's systematic in your company or is that uh, something that just came naturally? Because I think that's really great to have a, a safe space where you know, uh, one can debrief their emotions or what they, they, they're going through and get some advice, mm -hmm. like verify their perception on their, like about themselves or their performance performance or or about how the way the others are talking to them or like how to deal with that how to communicate so I think that's really great and I think that can be a, a you know a, a way to cope with stress in in such a, a you know sometimes a difficult environment so is that something regular yeah. or yes it was something that I think They tried to do it at Disney. They tried to team you up with someone. And it, and because they assigned you someone, it didn't necessarily feel right. And it didn't actually work for me because it was not the right match. But I did realize that it was a wise thing. So I think I was, even though it wasn't like, they had a program, even though it wasn't great, I realized the benefit of what they were trying to achieve. And so I just started doing that. I do think that that's why I caution people to be careful, though, because if everybody's unhappy and they're all talking about it like in one big group, Negativity loves company, right? What is it? Misery loves company. And so I do think that can be unhealthy. 
especially if they're not doing anything about it. But I do think if you have like one or two confidants and, you know, there's always things that happen that you need to be able to talk about. When it comes to this, the 19 year old I'm speaking about, um, so since I left Disney and even when I was there, I, I've always become a mentor in other areas. So like women in animation, like six years ago when I first joined, they had, before they did their mentorship circles that they do today, they did one-on-one. -on -one. And so I mentored someone that way. And I've just always felt like I wanted to give back. And so the person that I'm mentoring right now is part of Rise Up Animation. So Rise Up Animation, like Philip mentioned, we, um, if you are a person of color, so you're black, indigenous, or a person of color, and you're 18 or older, and you're interested in the animation industry, and that means producing, it could be HR, recruiting, all of the art departments, voiceover, everything. Um, you can sign up and then you'll get a mentor and that mentor will give you advice and feedback on your art if you have art or a resume. And every mentor gets to decide how much time they can give. So let's say you sign up and you get a mentor that doesn't have the bandwidth to continue. They'll let you know that. They'll be, it's a one-time session and then you can sign up again in 60 days and talk to someone else. So you get different POVs. But some mentors like myself, I, when I meet somebody, I'm like, I, I'm like family. I, I want to know, I want to track their careers. So I've met with probably 110 mentees since I started Rise Up Animation, and it hasn't been a year. We started June 5th, so we're almost a year. And so each of those mentees can always email me and ask for time. I, they don't all do it at once, clearly, or I would be insane. Um, but that's, that's how I do it. And so, you know, I do a few new people. So I've done seven new people this month, and then I always, you know, get it. Ask some, someone will ask for time, and I let them, you know, meet with me, tell me what's going on. I give them advice. Sometimes we do uh, mock interviews, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, that's so interesting, and and it's amazing that you're doing that. Is there something that comes up um, in terms of communication that is usually challenging for the people you're mentoring? Um. Yeah, it's interesting. A lot of them are, a lot of them are just in college or just graduated, and their experience in the work field, um, you know, isn't like this nineteen-year-old. Like clearly, she's already in. She's, she is, you know, working at a full production company in another country. So there's cultural stuff. So we talk about things, and I may give her advice, and she'll say, you know, I don't know if that'll work here, and I'll say, well, I understand that. I understand that it's a very strong patriarchy where she's at. I was like, but I still think there are small ways that you can try to make movement. So let's don't just accept the situation, you know. So, so yes and no. I mean, I think that uh, what I notice most it's funny because a lot of them are either they either they come off as very like they don't mean to, but like very like entitled. Like I want to make movies that are about da da da, and it's like I'm like that's awesome. But I kind of coach them like you have to you have to temper that when you're going into your interview because you don't want someone to be put off by all that amazing passion. So I try to use um, my experience to help them, you know, not change by any means, but like think about how they're delivering. And it's great when you see someone go, aha, yeah, you're right. I know I can come off that way. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, but don't pull back too far because that's the natural thing that human beings do, right? The pendulum. We swing it so far to the other side that that's your point earlier, Dr. Mal. You're like, you can't just stop talking or, or, you know, or lose your place at the table because of that criticism. You have to just find a new avenue, a new way. Evolve. For, for our last, for our last uh, topic or question is um, how, how, do we, how do we deal with, with toxicity? Sometimes you, you kind of, you are in your position, you feel stuck. You have someone who is... Uh, not communicating with you in a way this person should be communicating. What what are these kinds of tools you can uh, build up to a help yourself and b also maybe help this other person uh, to reflect um, and may maybe this from a from a, a psychological uh, point of view of what 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 can we do to help and to help ourselves. One of the approaches I would suggest involves understanding what the problem is. So for instance, you might be looking at a an emotion focused solution, um, which would address how the toxicity, how the rupture, how the harm actually made us feel, you know, what was the impact of that? 
And sometimes it's important to start there. It means we may need to talk to someone. It means we may need to process. Monica talked about often processing with her partner um, in order to just get those feelings out and put names to it and, and vent, um, which can be very healthy. But also we need to remember that there are uh, problem-oriented coping uh, styles too. And this means that, yes, we address the emotions that this brought up, but also what are the practical things we need to do to resolve it? Is there a person who is toxic or um, creating a toxic culture? How do we address that situation? Is there a type of communication or interaction that we're noticing in the work environment that we need to address? Um, you know, recently I've been doing a lot of workshops and talks about allyship and often there's this jump into like, okay, what, what do allies need to do? How do we, uh, become more supportive? How do we create helpful solutions? And sometimes I have to pause and say, but have you already, have you addressed the original harm? We can't jump into allyship without first talking about, you know, how were we perpetuating or contributing to the toxicity, to the harm, to a, a systemic oppression, you know, what, what can we recognize about that? That type of healing has to happen. So if anything, it's a, it's an ongoing dynamic process versus, oh, we just need to uh, cancel somebody or something, you know, that's not often that effective. You know, I have to say something that I, it's, it's going to seem like really Monica with the three of you ladies on here, but I would say, yes, talking to my spouse is great, but I can't use my spouse or my family to, you know, it's fine one, one here and there, but that is not, you can't expect them to help you support you with all of that. If it's a whole bunch. So that's when you really need to seek out a professional. So for me, I think talk therapy. So having a, you know, um, a therapist and then having if you need potentially a psychiatrist is very helpful i mean i know it's it's not as taboo in the u.s as it is in other um, countries and cultures but it's still considered taboo so i just want to verbalize that i don't know that i would have made it as far as i have without extensive talk therapy and then i realized you know there's chemical imbalance you know there's people of course have mental illness which again is also something that people don't like to talk about I love to talk about it. Um, there's, there's mental illness, there's chemical imbalances that does exist in my family. And I started to realize that while I, I didn't have like the bipolar issues that maybe another family member had, I was having anxiety and the anxiety that I was having and letting go into my body made me really even more intense and maybe talk a lot more and interpret things negatively. So, while I'm not suggesting, Philip, in your question that there aren't people that are creating toxic, sometimes you have to wonder if, if is it me though? Like I, if I have a problem with every single person I'm working with, it may not be the people, right? So, so for me, I did, um, and when I was about 40, uh, I had just gotten promoted to production manager and I was going to Africa for two weeks and I was just really stressed off to be taking the time off. And I literally kind of had my brain shut down on me. I just, my body just couldn't take it. And so my doctor was like, you know, I really think you might need a medication. And my mom was like, yeah, you do. And so I got on Lexapro and I, people don't want to talk about it because they think it's so taboo, but literally 10 milligrams and it had changed my life. It took the edge off of the anxiety and allowed me to be me without that. And so I just want to encourage people. I'm not saying everyone needs to be medicated. That is not my message by any means, but don't think that it's, you know, it's always someone else. Like you, you do need to look at yourself. You do need, um, to me, it's an ally to have someone that you can speak to professionally because that's what they're for. You, you can't put that all on a family member. Would you agree ladies? Yeah. I, uh, I, um, I agree hundred percent with what you're saying, Monica. Did, did I interrupt? Sorry. Did I interrupt you? No, I was, well, I was just going to say there are three other things that I thought of when Philip was asking about what other tools, you know, and this is definitely not something, uh, this is definitely something that Eckhart Tolle kind of taught me. And this is what I kind of live by now. And I verbalized to my mentees as well, is that, you know, in this moment, there really are no problems. It's when we start thinking about the 
past, right, and we have regret over what we said or did, or we think about the future and we're stressed about that, that's because we're living in the future. But if you're living in the moment, there really are no problems. But I know people will say, but I have a boss that's this way. Okay, well, you can either you can either accept the situation because you can't change them and accept it and let it go and not let it bother you and just, just accept it wholeheartedly. Or you can get out of the situation, like realize, I don't want to speak up and I don't want to work under this and remove yourself from it. Or you can do something about it by having the conversation. Now, how you have the conversation, that's what we've been talking about, right? Empathy with love and, and you know, they're in a, in a curated way. You have to be ready for that conversation. You can't just blurt it out. But I think that's kind of how I look at it. So I don't know if that helps, but... I really, I really like Monica what she said about uh, how sometimes like some situation where we live like very stressful situation can have an impact on our mental health and there's different ways to deal with that I think there's both like prevention so we have to think like what can I do or what do I want to do with that situation so can I address it can I communicate to make it change but it might not change because it's not all on your hands. There's a, if there's a communication problem or a toxic environment, as you mentioned, it might be there. So then you have to take a decision like, do I want to stay there or should I leave? What are my values? What are my top priorities? And that can help take a decision in that situation. And it's prevention, so it's always best when we when we do. But sometimes when we realize that we are in that stressful situation, sometimes it's too late because we realize it because we're, you know, close to the burnout or we're, maybe we have some vulnerability that was there and mental illness can come in those those times. And I think, as you mentioned, Monica, it's very important to seek professional help. Like our friends and family can help us in like regular days, but we just don't want them to become our therapist. They won't be able, they won't have the distance and you're going to ruin your relationship as well. So professional help can be like psychotherapy, as you said, like talking therapy and just helping you reflect on the situation and help you find solution. And sometimes it can also be medication. And as you said, there's many taboos on medication, but one must know that the, the, the brain is functioning with chemicals that your body is just, uh, you know, uh, producing itself. And, and when there's too, too much stress, there comes chemical imbalance and medication can help bring back that balance. So you're, brain can function normally and then deal with the situation. So I really appreciate you opening on that because uh, people don't talk about it much and that keeps the taboo uh, going on. So thanks for that, Monica. My general practitioner, when we were talking about medication, said to me, because I was like, I don't need that. This is early on. And she was like, well, why do you say that? Why are you so against it? I said, because, I mean, I'm not crazy because that's the taboo, right? And she said to me, but Monica, if you had diabetes, which she knows runs in my family, she goes, and you tried to not use medication. So you tried exercise and eating right. And you tried all that and it didn't work. And you would die without, you know, you would be really bad off without it. Would you take the medication? And I said, well, sure. She said, well, then why is it any different with mental illness? You've been exercising, you've been doing all these things to try to help your chemical imbalance and it's not working. And that for me was the ticket. Mm. It was so wild. So anyway, I just wanted to share that for all of you uh, people who watch this and may still be skeptical about it, because you're right, um, mm. Dr. Amal and Dr. Gray, like it's important. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Camille, can you please uh, sum up our key takeaways? Thank you, Monica, for sharing your story. Um, it's clear that everyone communicates differently, right? And I think that understanding that um, can alleviate some frustration and help us um, manage our own communication and develop that skill because communication is a skill that can be developed and it does start with reflection within, right? Um, that could look like, Monica, you mentioned seeking out help, whether it's through a mentor, through reading, just like look, looking for different resources. Um, so definitely understanding how you communicate and how others communicate can alleviate a lot of stress, frustration, and other emotions. Um, another thing to consider is that when when we choose to speak up, uh, Monica, I love that you mentioned being brave, right? And we can do that coming from a space of res 
being respectful um, and finding love and kindness and always bringing it back to to ourselves versus putting it on the other person. So um, a, a lot of really amazing things were said today. Um, thank you so much again, Monica and Dr. Amal, Dr. Drea for, for your knowledge. Thank you so much. A pleasure. Thank you all. It's so lovely to be here with you. Thank you very, very much for, for sharing your stories today, Monica. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dre, Dr. Amal, for, for giving us your, your expert opinion, Camille, you as, as well. Thank you so, so much. It's, it's so amazing to, to listen to this um, topic, which we don't really talk about which is kind of weird in itself because it's about communication. Um, but it's so important that we talk about this. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thank you to our audience for, for listening in, for watching. And uh, have a look at the, the other chapters on the Visual Effects Society website, on vfxmontreal.com, uh, on YouTube, on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts. Thank you very much and goodbye.